Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The Capitol may be closed due to the pandemic, but this week you can visit it virtually. Architect Cass Gilbert's vision of symmetry, high art, and classical ideals is realized in the Capitol's magnificent art and architecture. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As we embark on our virtual tour of the Minnesota State Capitol, we begin with an overview of the grand floor, where symmetry, functionality, and beauty come together to fulfill architect Cass Gilbert's aesthetic. The second floor of the State Capitol is really the focal point of all of the activity that happens here. What was Cass Gilbert's idea behind this particular design? The uh, second floor is really called the grand floor of the Capitol because it's where everyone can come up here, get access to the chambers, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And it's a place where all that activity is taking place each day of session. So you have people lobbying for interest groups here. You have the public that are here to talk to their legislators and so forth or go to the Supreme Court for their hearings. So really the, the envision that Cass Gilbert had for this uh, space and the second floor was to be a grand space where you really get a sense of the, the architecture, these beautiful colonnades of Italian marble column and Minnesota stone. And you also get a place where people feel friendly or welcoming into those spaces as at the same time they're visiting or coming here for business. In the other capitals I've visited, I've noticed that the House Chamber is often across from the Senate Chamber, but not here in our capital. What is the reason for that? Well, I think what Cass Gilbert was looking at doing is creating a, a symmetrical building. And so we have, in 1905, there were 63 senators, not the 67 we have today, but we had 119 House members. So that's almost twice the size. So I think for him, how you construct a building with one end of the building with a smaller chamber and the other opposite end with a huge chamber just doesn't fit architecturally. So he put the Senate chamber on the west side of the building, the Supreme Court, a smaller chamber of course, on the opposite end and then the house because of its size fit perfectly in the north corridor or the north side of the buildings. It may just be a matter of folklore but I've read that the placement of the house chamber looking at the city of St. Paul is important in terms of representing the people, that the speaker is looking at the people. Is that true? Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people look at the, the way the uh, spaces have been designed or laid out, uh, that Gilbert was looking at the house being kind of the approachable. It's more of the people's house. The members serve a two-year term, so there's more rotation or more changeover as uh, members leave or get uh, re-elected or not re-elected. And there are more of them. And there's more of them as well. And so the idea is, it kind of symbolically, it faces the public, faces downtown St. Paul. In 1905, when the Capitol opened, the cons all of the state's constitutional offices were housed in this building, and that's not true today. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The uh, whole idea of the building here was, this is the seat of state government. So you have your executive branch officers, you have the governor, lieutenant governor, the state treasurer, the state auditor, the uh, secretary of state. Uh, the Attorney General all housed within this one building in 1905. And that gives you a sense of how this building has changed over its 112 year history because you have uh, a lot of those constitutional officers moving out to different chambers. They're going into uh, the state office building back in the 60s and the 70s. You had the administration building where the treasurer moved into it. Now the treasurer, we as a constitutional amendment, abolished the treasurer's office so there no longer is a treasurer. And that also fits in with the, the history of the Supreme Court too. They uh, were, until the 1990s, uh, everything they had here, the offices, the law library, the chamber was their headquarters, kind of their center gathering place for all the work and all the business they do. And then when the uh, Judicial Center was open, they moved there. And so they have new uh, Supreme Court and appellate court offices and also uh, chambers there. But they still use this space in the state capitol as an important part of their connection to this building. The state's highest court still meets occasionally in the magnificent chamber at the state capitol. Brian Pease explains some of the art and architectural features of this historic space. The Supreme Court chamber sits in the east wing of the capitol building. Is it typical among state capitals, to your knowledge, to have a Supreme Court chamber within the capitol complex? 
Yeah, I think that's a pretty common uh, edifice or part of the building is to keep all three branches of gover government together. So a lot of capitals uh, were designed for all three branches, the House, the Senate, the judicial, and then, of course, the executive branch. And then over time, a lot of capitals uh, moved the Supreme Courts out of, the, um, uh, out of their capitals to other buildings. And so that's, uh, we still have the, our Supreme Court chamber here, but the, our state Supreme Court did move over to the Judicial Center in the 1990s. So that you know, is a little bit of the same, but still there's a really a strong historic presence in this chamber today. What was the impetus for the move, and is this space still being used? Yeah, this, this space is still part of that uh, monthly meetings that the Supreme Court will have hearings here. So they will meet the first week in the historic chambers within the state capitol. The second week of their hearings they have or hold at the Judicial Center. So once again, it's an important part of their history and heritage to be a part of this building. And they still want to keep that uh, presence here. And it is really a, a pretty spectacular space to have a, a court hearing. And that's, uh, I think, an attribute to the, their willingness to still be a part of the, the state capitol building. Every time I'm in this chamber, I'm always curious what is behind the curtain and why did they design it with a curtain, which just makes people like me wonder what's behind it. Yeah, it's part of just filling in that space behind the columns. Uh, there's a hallway and then a, a Supreme Court consultation or meeting room, and that's where after the hearings they've heard that morning are completed, that's where the justices will gather, uh, talk about the court cases, or just have uh, one of them assigned to write their opinion. because. Each justice has to weigh in, write their opinion of what they've heard that day and what their decision should be based on the legal precedent or what the law is or interpretation of the law. So that's an important gathering space for them before and after their hearings. As you sit in the chamber and look at the ceiling, there seems to be a lot of symbolic motifs in the design. Can you talk about what those mean? Yeah, there's uh, words written in Latin that says lex, which represents law. There's, once again, uh, horticulture and products of Minnesota. So once again, you're establishing the prosperity of the state. You know, it's all coming together to create uh, good laws and interpretation of the laws in this room. And then you also have uh, rod and bundles, which are uh, rods or wooden sticks that are bound together. And so that represents unity and strength. So it's, you know, easy to break one stick, but if you had a whole bundle, it's hard to break that unity and that strength of, of government and the, the strength and power of law, which is being discussed each and every day here. The other thing that's really fascinating is the skylight. As long as I've been here, this is the first time we've actually had natural light coming through the skylight. So that was So important. that was a change from the renovation. Right. That was an important part of this restoration of the chamber was to open up the skylight to bring in the natural light once again. And it does make this room very much more dramatic. Uh, and it changes the whole effect of this space that we had never seen before. A large part of Cass Gilbert's vision was art and the edification that comes from viewing art. There are four murals in this Supreme Court chamber. Can you talk about the, the meaning of each one of these murals? This is a really important part of understanding how the space is interpreted. Uh, it's, it's a huge mural it's done by John Lafarge, one of the, the great artists in America at that time. So there are different people portrayed, historical figures that are kind of telling you the story of where our laws came from. So uh, right behind the justices who sit in the, the long bench, uh, that's Moses. He's about ready to receive the Ten Commandments. That represents divine and moral law. Over to, if you're the viewer, to your left would be a large painting of Confucius. He's in a blue robe. He's looking at a scroll that's been written down that has precedent or decisions already made by other judges and courts. So we've talked about Moses. We've talked about Confucius. Then we get to the painting depicting ancient Greece. Yes, and that's Socrates, and so he is portrayed talking to friends of his. It's a scene right out of Plato's Republic where they're talking, he's talking about justice and the rights of individuals in a democracy, which is, a, of course, f first and foremost for any deliberation and, and justice or judge to, you know, always think of the rights of the individual, no matter what that situation might be. And then off to the other side of the, which would be the uh, to your right, if you're sitting in the chamber, is Count Raymond of Toulouse, France. It's a medieval setting, but he is standing between two disputing groups. So in front of him are uh, leaders from the church, behind him are city uh, leaders. So there's a dispute that they're having to resolve instead of going to war or going, you know, having violence. He's saying, come to me, I'll mediate, I'll, I'll help settle the conflicting interests so you don't have to, you know, 
go to war to fight out who's going to be right or wrong. And then, of course, as you leave the chamber, it says, where law ends, tyranny begins, which is a statement then about the importance of the legal system in our state. Right. And that's, once again, it, it helps guide. You know, the state constitution is the rules for the governing of the state of Minnesota, and the laws are what help make that, that state prosper or provide the rights of the individuals. And if you don't have the law, then you can have tyrants or people take over, make their own laws. And so... Once again, the Supreme Court is a part of that balance of government and what is voted upon and you know, signed by the governor as a new law in the, you know, with the House and the Senate and the governor having that say, the court ultimately has a final say if that law is valid or not through their interpretation. And that only gets challenged through the legal system, through the courts. Capitol architect Cass Gilbert believed that placing fine art within the Capitol building would advance the education, civilization, and intelligence of the state. Muralist Edwin Blashfield created two enormous masterpieces for the Senate chamber. One of the many areas in the state capitol that is filled with beautiful artwork is the Senate chamber. There's two very large murals overlooking Senate proceedings. How did they come to be here? Well, that was all part of the original vision of Cass Gilbert, the architect of the state capitol. When you walk through the building, he's always, as he was planning the, the design and the, and the shape of the spaces, he was always incorporating art and architecture together. So he would design a room where he would put the notable architectural features, but also create space for art. So you have this beautiful classical architecture, but you have paintings that tell you stories about the state or whatever building you're, you're telling, telling the stories of that state or that building's history. So that's what was happening in this space. These are two large murals that really talk about important events or kind of how we became a state we were in 1900 when this building was being built. The mural on the north wall it depicts the headwaters of the Mississippi. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's called the, the discoverers and civilizers led to the source of the Mississippi River. So the figures on, on one side are those explorers, going all the way back to the French explorers, to the people who eventually did find that source of the Mississippi River in 1832. And the other side has the people, once that land and, and so forth, that source was discovered, people are being shown moving in to that land. And then in the center, you have the, the Manitou, uh, the father of waters who is actually pouring, starting the flow of the river from an urn. And then you also have two uh, Indian people represented there. And one is kind of in a defensive position because, because of the European influence, things are going to be changing for them and for their people. But once again, you're looking at the building from the eyes of the builders of this building in 1900. So the Mississippi River, that was the lifeblood for the entire state's history. You had cities built there, you had the water falls on St. Anthony that was generating the water power for the flour mills. And so that, that river was a vital part and still is a vital part of our, our history. And the mural on the south wall brings in uh, the patriotism of Minnesota and Minnesota's agriculture. Can you talk more about that? Right. That's also a very interesting depiction because it's talking about uh, not only the agricultural history, but it throws in the state's patriotism. So on the far right side, it has Civil War soldiers. So that represents our willingness to volunteer to fight in that Civil War. And then in the center has an oxen that's pour, pulling a large cart with all the produce, all the products that we can generate as an agricultural state. And then the families, the people, the farmers that are coming in to use that land to make it a very prosperous state. And what's really, uh, really neat about those depictions is there's also kind of a, uh, Edwin Blashville, the artist, is telling a little bit of a time warp or time change because you see with those Civil War soldiers, you'll see the younger soldiers in the foreground and in between the cart and the other soldiers on the far right are the old veterans. So now you've had this time from 1861 to 1905 where the, those soldiers now are the gray-bearded veterans that are coming back to the state capitol. And there's something important hidden in plain sight. Can you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. One of the things that Evan Blashville, the artist, wanted to do is to recognize uh, Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of the building, and then Channing Seabury, who was the vice president of the Capitol Building Commission, pretty much the head official for that whole process. And so he said in, in the Renaissance time, an artist would often you know, only be successful because he had a patron to help him you know, support his career and help do the work uh, that you know, the patron wanted to be done. So as a consideration for that support, 
those artists of the Renaissance would often put a, their patron's face or their features in, into a painting. And so in a sense, it's a thank you for a, the commission. Yeah, it, it's a recognition for the work that these two men did to make this building happen. And so those are found at the far left side of the, the painting that uh, kind of behind one of those uh, classical figures, you can see the profiles of those two important figures. The artist Edwin Blashfield came to Minnesota for the installation of these paintings, and then they stood relatively untouched, I understand, until 1988 with the first restoration effort, and then they were restored again for the grand reopening of the Capitol. Can you talk about those restoration efforts? Sure. The whole uh, history of these paintings has kind of been clouded in, in you know, just a few obscure references to some work that might have been done in the 30s. Uh, there's some photos of them bringing an artist or even people to clean the murals of the dust and the grime and if you think back in 1900, 1905, 1910, 1920, they're burning coal. So you're going to have this fine sooty layer that's going to be on all the surfaces. We discovered a lot of the paintings, not only in the Senate chamber, but all over the building, had sections of them overpainted. So in the 30s, they brought in artists to probably give them an employment or the some Part jobs. of the works project. Right. So they would be employed, you know, give them some work to do, and then they subtly changed colors, they added things to the paintings, the compositions are still the same. And so once again, that's something you can't see until you actually go and physically investigate that. So in 88, they were cleaned, they um, had a conservator come in and cleaned off the old varnish and the dirt and the grime. And then when we had this last project, we had the conservators actually go back and remove the non-original paint. So the new paint was chipped away with knitting needles and bone folders, anything with a sharp tip or whatever the conservator preferred, they inch by inch chipped away all the non-original paint to get back to the original colors. And what we see today is really a reflection of what Edwin Blashfield had wanted for the colors and the designs that we see today. The chamber for the House of Representatives is the largest room in the Minnesota Capitol, and it has many unique features. Brian Pease tells us more. We're here in the House chamber, the largest chamber in the Minnesota State Capitol. It accommodates all 134 representatives, as well as joint sessions, uh, like the Governor's State of the State Address. There are many unique features to this space, but I'd like to start with Minnesota, the spirit of government, which is the statuary above the speaker's desk. I understand it's not original. What's the story? Yeah, if you were here in 1905 and sitting in the gallery seats where we are, right above us here, you probably would have had people looking back at you because that whole archway was open with about oh, just over 200 gallery seats. So it was public gallery viewing space to watch the house in session. And then, uh, as it is the case in most capitals, government expands staffing needs are greater, and so they need more office spaces. So they took out the uh, gallery seats and put another floor of off, two floors of office space for the house staff to work there. So then that gave them a reason to decorate that front wall because now you have this big space that needs some decoration. So they created a statue uh, done by St. Paul uh, plasterers and artists, Carlo and Amerigo Brioschi, and they wanted to represent the spirit of government. That's the figure at the top most, the female figure with the star. So she's Minnesota. And so you have dates of 1849, 1858 inscribed in the book that she holds open. And then there's also, uh, because we were part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, everything west of the Mississippi River was part of that purchase. And so the artist wanted to commemorate the, the role of Lewis and Clark in our, in our pre-state history. So the woman who was seated, the American Indian woman, is Sacagawea, who was a guide who led Lewis and Clark. The other Native American man is a, just a person they would have encountered or would have helped them on the expedition. And then on the far right are not Lewis and Clark, but it's uh, French explorers and voyageurs who were the first Europeans who came into Minnesota. So what they were doing is they were making that connection to the existing stencil work that you have in the ceiling where you have names of Hennepin, Duluth, LaSalle, Perot, who were also those same contemporary uh, French explorers and fur traders that were here. You know. So it's honoring the whole s the entire history of the state, even pre-statehood. Right, yeah, and that's, that's the connection. It's you know, going back to the 1680s up to the 1800s and then eventual statehood. 
Behind the speaker's desk is a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. First, why is there a portrait of Abraham Lincoln? It wasn't part of the original design. And also there's a story about how this is not an original there, it's a copy. Can you talk about that? Sure, it, this was an image of um, Abraham Lincoln from a painting called The Peacemakers done by George Healy. And he did a couple of other paintings to, uh, because that was kind of the, f the represent representational figure of that piece was Abraham Lincoln. And so he wanted to uh, go to a competition in Europe, made a copy for that, ex uh, that exposition or that competition, and then gave copies to Elihu Eli Washburn, who was a friend of Lincoln's from Illinois, and also one to um, uh, Robert Lincoln, his son. So William Washburn, who was a brother of Elihu Washburn, acquired the painting from his brother. And then when this building was opened, the family, William Washburn's family, wanted to put that on display here. So now we had that painting on display for several decades. Well, then they wanted it back. And so it had become such an important part of the decoration of this building, of this room. So in 1937, they had uh, Edward Brewer, a local artist, make a copy of the original painting. And that's what we have here. So it's a reproduction of the original. And then eventually that original painting that was here for those 20 some years is now in the National Portrait Gallery in the Smithsonian. And I also understand that this depiction of Lincoln, his son Robert Todd Lincoln, felt that this was the best representation of his father. It was, yeah. And eventually the painting that he was given by George Healy, the artist, ended up in the White House. So it's in the White House dining so room. It's in the White House dining room by the fireplace, yeah. Let's talk about the speaker's chair, which uh, was designed by Cass Gilbert, fell into disrepair, came back. What's the significance of it? Yeah, it's, it's what was designed for this space for the Speaker of the House to have, and it's a very ornamental, very important seat because it has a star with La Toile Lenore, the, star, the state motto inscribed in the back and the top of that, that chair. And um, like all the furniture in the building, we still have a lot of the historical original furniture in the building, but people, you know, didn't always treat the, the furniture as well as they should. This one actually was in pretty good shape. And so it just, once again, kind of was out of date. Um, the swivel things were broken on it. And then when this chamber was restored in 1989, then we brought that chair back, had it restored, and has been back in the chamber since that time. Another element of the restoration was that the clock that was original to the chamber was found in a closet wrapped in newspaper, and now it's back resting where it belongs. But how, why was it hidden, and, and how was it found? Yeah, it was something that I think, you know, you had to wind it every day, so it was a maintenance issue. It seemed to be working fine when they unboxed it, and so there had to be some updates and some fixing to make it electrified. But really, that was an important part of the original design. Each chamber has a big marble face clock. And so that was from the house chamber taken down. They just had a regular clock you could plug in. And then when, when this was discovered, it was like, let's put it back because that's where it belongs. Uh, let's talk about the ceiling, the very, very beautiful ceiling. I understand it was, it was done by Elmer Garnsey. What are some of the symbols and important things to note about the ceiling? Yeah, it's, once again, it's an arabesque. So if you walk throughout the entire state capitol, you'll see these beautiful motifs that represent symbols of uh, kind of ancient Rome, but also the Renaissance period, where you have festoons of products and things of Minnesota that are represented in the artwork. And that's the same thing you see here. You see a lot of M's for Minnesota. You see these elaborate motifs woven together that talk about the, the products of the state of Minnesota. And you'll see also uh, some symbols that really focus on instructing the people who work here. So there's one uh, painted stencil that has an hourglass with an owl on top and a star above its head that represents symbolically use your time wisely because you do have lim limited time to, to create the business for the state and the laws of the state. So you have to get your work done in a certain amount of time. Was this a part of Cass Gilbert's plan, or is it just folklore that as the House of Representatives has the most representatives of the people, that the Speaker is looking towards the people? It can be a combination of both. Um, it is the largest chamber. It also fronts St. Paul because logistically, you know, if you're designing the building and you want to make it symmetrical, the chamber is so much larger than the Senate, so you couldn't put it on one side of the building. It would make the symmetry fail. So he put it on the, nor the north side, but also it is kind of symbolically you walk out the front of the chamber and then you see the doors to the city of St. Paul and the state of Minnesota. So a lot of people see that as the house is a little bit more 
of the people, more approachable in that sense of the, of the direction of the chamber. And that, and that could be a lot of that could just be folklore, something that's kind of a, a neat thing to say because it is an important part of what happens in this building. It's about access to the people. So, and it's a good story. I, I don't want to negate it because it really does have a, a connection to the people who work here as well. The action and events at the Minnesota Capitol are documented by staff photographers in both the House and the Senate. Recently retired Chief Senate Photographer David Oakes did this work for more than 35 years. Here are some of his favorite images. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.